Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Brett Royal, founder and CEO of Implant Concierge. Uh, so excited to, uh, to host today's webinar. Uh, it really is exciting to have everyone here. The attendee list is climbing, and uh, we're just excited for what we're going to be able to provide you guys today. Today is a, uh, it's a really exciting this webinar because the case itself is pretty amazing. It's in combination of a patient has been followed for 20 years. Dr. Tom Wilson, Dr. Nathan Stewart will present on. And it's also, it's a combination of years of experience, a lot of care, um, some powerful digital technology coming together with some creative solutions to think outside the box to provide a solution um, for a patient that needs some help. So I think today you're going to get a, a lot of experience, a lot of creative ideas, and you're going to learn a whole lot from this case presentation. I think uh, what, what's also most exciting about this is that for all intent and purposes, this was a very successful case for Dr. Wilson and Dr. Stewart, and they had a very happy patient. However, um, we all learned a lot in this case as well. So we're excited to show you our successes, but also talk about some of the things that we learned along the way, that we were always continuing the, the process of education, becoming better at what we do in our crafts, whether it's combining digital technology um, or just learning the basics and going back to the basics of dentistry. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Let me go ahead and introduce you to the host today. There are a lot of moving parts for our webinar. Uh, so Andy, we'll hit that next slide. So uh, myself, Brett Royal is a host, as well as Andy Mori, who will be serving as our moderator. Um, Andy's worked with Implant Concierge for a little over five years now and has a lot of experience in digital dentistry and is going to be going to have a very, um, a very important job of observing all the questions and helping you guys and also butting in and helping Dr. Wilson and Nathan Stewart by asking some of the questions. And also Lauren Tolliver. Uh, Lauren is a 3D case coordinator and also helps with the training team here at Implant Concierge. And what Lauren is going to be doing is that she'll actually be hosting a, a live, uh, what we call a VIP or a virtual implant planning session. So today's, uh, today's meeting is a lot of moving parts. So we're hoping to, to pull it together really smooth to give you guys a great learning opportunity. Andy, why don't you go ahead and kind of give us some of the ground rules as far as the, the housekeeping. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, so once again, as Brett introduced, my name is Andy Mori from Implant Concierge, and I just wanted to go through a couple of things um, as far as housekeeping rules for the webinar itself and a couple of navigational tips. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, this webinar, our goal is for it to be very interactive, very, ed uh, very educational. So we highly encourage, you know, participation, um, being interactive, asking different questions. Uh, that being said, we do want to preserve the flow of the presentation, we do want to reduce any sort of distractions or background noise. So as a default, everyone will be muted during this webinar. However, you are able to ask questions um, throughout the webinar that I as the moderator will try to filter in and address to Dr. Wilson, um, or they may be left till the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so today we are hosting this webinar on an application called GoToWebinar. And I just wanted to go through a couple of kind of uh, navigational tidbits so you know how to kind of maximize or optimize your experience. The first is right now, you should have two main screens on your computer, one that's actually showing the presentation as well as our webcam, and then a small kind of little control center off to the side. So if you ever want to minimize this control center so that it's not blocking any part of the presentation, you just have to click that little orange arrow that's on your control center, and that's going to go ahead and minimize it. In regards to the audio, you're more than welcome to use either your computer audio or your phone audio. Um, and you can see that you're able to switch between the two based on those little bubbles to the right hand side. Now, when it comes to asking questions throughout the webinar, um, you're able to type it into that little questions box. And once again, I'll be able to see those questions, kind of filter and moderate them. Um, and those questions only us as organizers can see. It's not broadcasted out to the other attendees. Now, in regards to what you actually see on your screen, you should see a combination of webcams as well as our presentation. Um, at the top of that window, there should be uh, an icon for everyone, an icon for webcam, an icon for Zoom. When you click on that Everybody tab, you're, uh, you can see that you're able to adjust 
whose webcam you're viewing, whether you want to see all the organizers, just who's talking or whoever's presenting at the moment, or if you don't need the webcam, you have the option to hide them as well. And then the last bit is uh, this webinar is available for CE credit. So if you're interested in getting CE for participating in this webinar, once we conclude the meeting, there should be a little window that pops up on your screen um, that's going to prompt you with the course survey. Just be sure to completely fill out that survey and click submit, and it'll go ahead and submit it to us on our end. And then I'll go ahead and be emailing out that attendance verification um, to everybody who I received a survey from. And so for those of you who joined us last week, um, you'll know that we already uh, initiated our radiology series of webinars. So the second session is coming up tomorrow for level one pathology. And you can see that there's level two and three um, the following Thursdays as well for the rest of this month. So I just wanted to remind everybody of some upcoming webinars we have. Uh, we would love to see you there. So register, please, if you're available. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Great job on the house rules. I know it's a, it can be a delicate balance because I'm sure, sure there's going to be a lot of great questions. So good luck with your job today, Andy. All right. So welcome to the to the topic today, guided surgery series, uh, the immediate extract, immediate place, full arch maxilla with a surgery ready provisional. Really, we have four key learning objectives that we want to accomplish today. One is that we want to implement a minimally invasive sequential surgical guide system. So you're going to see a surgical guide system that we talked about being creative in its design of how to implement it, of using the patient's current anatomy to get to where you want to be on the, on the finished uh, anatomy. Number two is that, you, like I said, we'll also have a, a live VIP session where you'll be able to place implants virtually in the ideal recorded position. And then the third focus is to looking at guide designs to talk about preserving bone, not reducing it. There's a lot of discussion with bone reduction versus not bone reduction surgical guides. So you're going to see a non-bone reduction surgical guide technology and also design and process. And, of course, it's all about having a predictable and efficient conversion as far as a surgery-ready provisional. So this, there's a lot of points going on, a lot of education to take place. So we're really excited about it. All right. So I, I kind of preluded this in, in my learning points here. I'm trying to get that slide just to move for me there, Andy. Let's see. Um, in dentistry right now, especially in the guided surgery scope, when it comes to full arch dentistry, there's really two things I'm seeing a lot of. Um, and one of them seems to be um, taking more of the social media by storm. You know, whether you want to call it full arch Fridays or whatever, but you hear a lot about stackable surgical guides and bone reduction guides. Um, here at Implant Conscious, we don't use the term uh, stackable. Um, we use a different term called connect. But at the end of the day, it's the same concept where you have one surgical guide that adheres to the bone. It allows you to reduce the bone, create space, and then go ahead and use a surgical guide that's going to connect or stack and build up all the way to the provisional. The other option that's not as um, widely seen in social media, I think because it's not as sexy, it's not as glo uh, gory, so you don't see as many uh, slides and, and social media posts about it, but it's what we call the anchor pin guide workflow at Implant Concierge. And that's what today's presentation is going to be on, is the anchor pin guide workflow to be efficient, uh, to be minimally invasive, and also to, to implement what I would consider normal or more standard uh, implant industry crown and bridge. And that's where Dr. Stewart and Dr. Wilson will really dive into to show you this approach. So let me go ahead now and introduce our speakers. Uh, the first one is Dr. Tom Wilson. Uh, he's been a periodontist since 1974 in North, North Dallas. Um, I mean, if you've been around implant industry for, for more than a few years, you probably know his name. You've probably read some of his articles. Um, he's been a great friend to, to me personally uh, and to implant conscious for many, many years. Um, he balances technology, cutting edge dentistry, along with some really strong basics that he's learned over the years, just practicing more than 10 or 15 years. Uh, and of course, our other presenter, Dr. Nathan Stewart, he's going to bring the restored component. He practices in, in Rockwall, Texas, which is a town northeast of Dallas. Um, and Rockwall is one of those towns that just has really exploded over the last few years. And 
So I'm sure Dr. Stewart's really advanced, uh, taking advantage of that gain of that beautiful town. Uh, but he's been pricing dentistry since two, 2015. So with that being said, uh, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Stewart, thank you so much for presenting for us, showing off this case, and uh, have a great time and best of luck to you guys. Well, good morning from Dallas. I'm about to do the hardest thing that I'm gonna do, and that is switch over my slides. So I wanna make sure that, uh, that uh, I've done that correctly. Get this out of the way. Go back over here, go to play. Now, according to my screen, you're seeing my slides. I hope you are. Looks uh, great. Welcome. Uh, we're really looking forward to today. I, I have the privilege of being with some really incredible people. Uh, one is Dr. Nathan Stewart. Uh, he and I have been working together for a number of years, and previous to that, uh, working with his partner, Dr. Tom Connor. Uh, kudos to Brett Royal and, and Andy and all of the people at uh, Implant Concierge. I've, I've worked with them since their inception, and gosh, we've all come a long way. Uh, and then there's Lauren Tolliver, who uh, I've known and, and as a friend and, and as a colleague uh, for years and years, and, and we've worked on a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. Also, the case, the latter part of the case today, uh, uh, we got some help from uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Pope, and I'd like to thank Jeff for that. Also, on a, a personal basis, uh, I'd like to thank my son, John, who is my partner for setting up my office today so that you can actually see me over this, uh, this cast and for my wife for trimming my hair this morning so it didn't fall over me. All right, so let's talk about digital approaches to implant dentistry and immediate placement, immediate load. This case goes back 20 years. Uh, she first presented to me in 2000. Uh, at that point, she was 57. She smoked about a pack a day. She had no known allergies, uh, taking no medications. Her chief complaint was she couldn't chew. Uh, she couldn't chew because she said she had uh, thermal sensitivity and pain on almost all of her mandibular teeth, uh, and uh, that led to an inability to masticate. Uh, clinical and radiographic exam basically said, yeah, that's what's going on. Uh, she had advanced dental caries on almost all of the remaining mandibular teeth. She had two failing uh, fixed partial dentures, one on the lower left posterior sextant, one on the lower right posterior sextant. Uh, the remaining teeth had a Miller scale of uh, three mobility, which is pretty, pretty high. Interestingly enough, she really didn't have much periodontal disease. She had some threes and fours. She had reasonable oral hygiene. Now, why is that a confounding factor? Well, first of all, we know she has a history of smoking about a pack a day for a number of years. Uh, if she had been a smoker, which she was, and had a history of periodontitis, that really pit, puts her at a greater risk for implant loss. And so we need to factor that in. Another thing that she denied, as often patients do in those situations, uh, is she denied that she was a Bruxer. But as, you'll, uh, as we go along, you will see that that is not true. So, we came up with a number of plans. We talked about a traditional uh, mandibular full coverage denture. Uh, we talked about trying to maintain the six uh, anterior teeth and do a removable partial. Uh, we talked about a removable partial denture that was implant supported. Uh, we talked about uh, two implants in the lower anterior with a full denture. She ultimately decided to remove the remaining teeth and place six implants. Uh, three of those, uh, 23, 26, and 28, were placed as immediates. Now, why did I place six implants? I placed six implants because this lady is 57. I placed my first implant in 1974. And one of the things I found out over the years is implants don't last forever. And if you build in back doors, uh, a long time later, you're often more satisfied. Uh, the other thing is that you have to talk about this lady's age. At that day, in that day and time, uh, we were not doing an, a large number of hybrids. Uh, the dentist that I started working with initially uh, had no experience with hybrid hybrids, but did have some experience with locators. So for a number of reasons, we opted not to remove bone. 
one of the problems you have is if you have a younger patient and you take out lots of bone and all the implants work, that's great. But if you take out that bone and now 20 years later, those implants fail, uh, you may not have enough bone left to support uh, any sort of a prosthesis other than a removable partial denture. So what we did is we placed the implants, uh, took them out, placed uh, those immediates at the same time, put in six implants, and we loaded it with a conventional denture. Uh, we loaded in, intentionally with a soft reliner, uh, which is always a problem in people like this who brux and who smoke, and ultimately used locators on all six implants uh, in the next year. Now, the lady was lost to my practice for a long time. Uh, in 2008, she came back. Her chief complaint was what you see on the screen, and that is that she had fractured uh, tooth number three. Uh, we did then what we do now, and that is we took out the tooth as atraumatically as we could. We sectioned it in three sections. Uh, we degranulated the area, cleaned it out with some iodine. Uh, here you see the uh, situation on the maxillary right, uh, posterior sextant. It is of note that she had a fixed partial denture that went from tooth number five to tooth number eight. That will become important later on in the treatment plan about uh, 10 years after this. So again, we uh, take out the teeth, uh, gently lift back from flaps. She didn't have much bone in the interfocal region coronalapically. So we used an approach that Paul Fugazzato has written about, and that is we gently tapped up that interfercal bone because that's ultimately where we're going to place our implant. Uh, we use then what we use now, and that is a combination of calcified and decalcified, excuse me, decalcified bone. Uh, this is human bone, and it's mixed with enamel matrix derivatives. Uh, that's what most people know as MDGAIN. We covered it with a dense PTFE membrane, uh, covered it partially as we normally do, waited 30 days, took it out, let it heal. At some later date, we placed an implant. Uh, the implant we placed uh, was uh, a uh, 10 millimeter 4.8 uh, tissue level implant. Uh, of interest, uh, this lady presented, <clears throat> excuse me, this lady presented in 2013 uh, having just had a uh, gastric bypass. Uh, during that time, she said she was bruxing quite a bit. She reported that implant in the 19 position was quite uncomfortable and ultimately it was lost. But the nice thing is we had a back door built in. Uh, because the back door was built in, nothing needed to be changed in terms of her prosthesis at that time. So here back to 2008, uh, the uh, implant in the number three position was restored. Again, this is a tissue level implant. Uh, interestingly enough, a few years later, uh, she presented with exactly the same problem uh, on tooth number 14, did exactly the same thing, took out the tooth, grew some bone, waited a while, put in a tissue level implant. Her new restorative dentist at that time had restored both of these uh, implants one in three and one in 14. So everything rocked along pretty well. She did pretty well, according to her. I saw her occasionally. Uh, she had transferred to Dr. Connor and Dr. Stewart's office over that time. And uh, so now we're to 2017. 17 years later, uh, after we did her mandibular implant. So she's now 75. She has a history of smoking. Uh, but she is no longer smoking. She's lost weight. She has no uh, allergies to no, any known medications, and she's not taking any medications. So here's the way pr she presented uh, in 2017. Her chief complaint, again, is on the upper right uh, sextant. Uh, you can see from the radiographs here that she has, again, experienced quite a bit of uh, severe decay. Uh, it is primarily involving that fixed partial denture that we saw from tooth number five to tooth number eight. So we talked about a number of approaches, and initially the approach we came to was to 
remove the involved teeth. That would be number four through number eight. Uh, do some guided socket preservation like we had talked about before, uh, and then just restore that upper right uh, quadrant. You can see that there has been uh, endodontic treatment on number 15, which was very successful over time. So we did to the right side on the maxilla what we had done in number three and number 14 previously, and that was took out the teeth, degranulated the areas, cleaned it with some iodine, 1%, uh, went in and put in, again, freeze-dried decalcified bone, a mixture of cancellous and cortical, uh, used uh, enamel matrix derivatives again, mixed with the graft, used the PTFE membrane uh, in the number four and five position. In the number uh, seven and eight position, we use soft tissue grafts to cover these areas because that gives us an extra band of keratinized gingiva. So that day we put on a snap-on smile. Now, if you've had experience with a snap-on smile, I, I hope your experience has been what ours has been. And then if you have this really large expanse like we have here, what options do you have for a provisional restoration? Well, you can have something that's removable. And if you do that and you're trying to maintain bone height, a lot of times you are not successful because that flipper or that partial will actually put pressure on that ridge. We really like the snap-on smile over time. Uh, it is very important to take an accurate impression. Uh, the good things about it are it's very stable. Uh, patients can actually chew with this and obviously it protects the surgical site. Uh, one of the problems with it is that it is monochromatic. If you don't like that color, you're in trouble. Now, there are several colors you can choose from, but they're all going to look the same. Uh, Nathan, would you like to talk about your experience with Snap-on Smiles? Um, yes. Yeah. Again, the only one downside is definitely the aesthetics. Um, they are one color, um, but, but what you have the ability to do with those, they're an overlay appliance. So they're, they're milled acrylic with a little flex to it. Um, so what that does is it, it allows you to play with the vertical dimension a little bit um, in the provisional. Um, also, it's, they, they, they tend to hold up, um, you know, an Essex or pretty much anything shy of a conventional partial. Um, you know, nothing would really survive probably the time span that we needed this provisional. So um, from, from a longevity standpoint, um, I'm very impressed with this. It's a DINMAP product, I believe, and you order it through, um, through their website. Actually, you can get it from a number, number of suppliers. Uh, we've had some problems with some of the suppliers, but we have somebody now that I think we feel comfortable with. All right, so now, okay, fast forward. Uh, we've done our tooth extractions. We've done our, quote, socket preservation or socket enhancement, and now we're six months down the line. So here's our snap-on smile. Here it is, right side, left side. And you can see this is designed to be relatively aesthetic but yet not to place uh, undue pressure on the uh, surgical sites. So now look at what we've got, okay? Oh, we're condemned by what we've done in the past. Back in 2000, we opted not to do a quote hybrid, if you will, and take away lower bone. So we have an adequate amount of space to make a lower partial uh, or a lower overdenture but it leaves us with a minimal amount of space in the maxilla. And so at this point, there's not a whole lot of options. Uh, you either have to do some sort of fixed restorative or you have to remove a, a significant amount of bone. Now, at this point, she's 75. Do we think she could probably make the trip if we took out that bone? Yeah, I think she probably could. One of the two things that we've got to worry about are the two implants. We've got an implant in number uh, three that's working very well and one in 14 that's working very well. More important than that, we went over all the options with the patient and she basically opted to take out the remaining anterior teeth. Now, she did that because of her caries history. She did that because she had, as you can see, fractured tooth number 10. Uh, she did that because she felt like she would have better function. And we agreed with her uh, with that treatment plan. So here we are six months after the uh, surgical procedures on the upper right. 
you can see that she's fractured tooth number 10. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Nathan, she also had some caries on the teeth on the uh, upper left posterior section. Is that correct? Yeah, she had yeah, recurrent caries on number nine and number 12. And I don't know if, if, if you see that in your practice, but I see a lot of that secondary to gastric surgeries, you know, crown margins, all these areas that have been stable for years. Um, you start to see breakdown there, which which did help her make that decision to given that risk category um, to go with something that may be more predictable long-term for her as she ages. Super. Uh, all right, so here are the periapical radiographs that we took after the uh, healing on the uh, maxillary right posterior sextant. Uh, it is of note, she has a very large incisive canal, so we're gonna have to work around that. That's gonna be interesting when we do our placement. Uh, so we're gonna take a uh, CBCT, uh, we're going to compare it to what we had before, and you can see as a result of the uh, socket enhancement that we did, uh, I think we ended up with some pretty reasonable bone. Now, one of the things you will notice here is that uh, one of the ways we're going to talk about how to relate the implant and the osteotomy to the final crown is by using uh, a barium impregnated uh, stent. And you can see on the number four site here in the post-op that we've got a barium stent there that uh, Lauren and uh, Nathan and I will talk about in a few minutes. So again, patient opted to go with the following plan. We're going to remove the remaining anterior teeth, but we're going to keep tooth numbers two and 15, and we're going to keep implants in three and 14. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, well, we want to make this as easy as we can on everybody. And I, and I know that everybody that's tried to do pickups of this type of prosthesis uh, the day of the day after surgery finds it very interesting. Well, I think what you're going to see today is the approach that uh, implant concierge has come up with uh, resolves a lot of those problems. At least it has for us. So we're going to develop a digital treatment plan. So at this point. Uh, Nathan has done a wax up, and so we're going to take a, uh, an impression of that. Uh, we're going to take that, make a vacuum form. We're going to fill it with some barium. Uh, we're going to make some 3.5 millimeter diameter openings in the barium where we want the uh, emergence profile of the implants to come out. We also have the advantage that before we took out the teeth on the maxillary right, uh, we had taken an STL file. So at this point, we can send to Lauren uh, at Implant Concierge a, a digital uh, scan, a CBCT, uh, with barium in it showing where we would like the implants to be in relation to the final restorations. We can send her uh, an impression, an STL file, if you will, of the uh, teeth before the extractions and also an STL file of the uh, uh, snap-on smile. And so at that point, we're going to turn it over to you, Lauren, and uh, talk about planning. Okay. Hello, everybody. Let's see here if I can get my screen sharing with you. All right. Give me one second. Change this over. While Lauren's getting her screen up here, I'll just say this. What she has done is she has taken the information we've given her. And when we set up a go to meeting, I'm in my office, Nathan is in his office, and uh, she's going to present me with the implants that I asked for. I'm going to say, okay, Lauren, we want implants in the following positions. Uh, she's going to go in and use the information that I've given her in terms of the SDL files that we sent. And in terms of the uh, uh, bone that we have uh, as uh, based on our CBCT, 
and she's going to come to me and say, okay, well, I've put some of these in the areas that you ask, and now let's go over each individual implant. Or I believe you're muted. Well, let me go on further. Uh, one of the things we found was that we were very concerned, as we always are, uh, with implant placement in the maxillary anterior area. That's especially important when we're going to use a uh, fixed crown and bridge, okay? Because you understand that the osteotomy, especially in the maxillary anterior, needs to come out slightly lingual to uh, the incisive uh, edge of the crown. Uh, a little bit further palatally if you want to use a sprue retain restoration, which we do anytime we have the opportunity. Uh, we do that because of the history of problems of cement. Uh, I think everybody knows by now that uh, uh, implants that have cemented restorations have uh, oft times uh, 8, 10, 12, 15 years later problems uh, directly related to the cement. One of the things we're doing right now is uh, some uh, studies with our group at the University of Texas, Dallas, uh, looking at why it takes that long for the cement to create a problem and whether or not this has anything to do with the interface between uh, the titanium and the uh, cement itself. Lauren, are you able to get up at this point? Well, I tell you what, let's let's move along from there. Can everybody see my screen now? Should I have three templates up there? Brett, can you see this? I still see Lauren's screen. Okay. Well, let me yeah, do see if I can do show I just my switched it back to you, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, I'm trying, but it's not letting me do that right now. It says show my screen. Let's see if I can just do that. How does that work? Is my that screen works. up now? That looks good. You're good to go, Dr. Wilson. Well, super. All right. So what's happened is that Lauren and Nathan and I have had a conversation. And we have looked at the interface between uh, the implant, the osteotomy site, and the proposed restoration based on the information that we had given to implant concierge. And they're going to come back to us with three different templates. The first template is to place anchor pins. The second template is a surgical template. The third template is a prosthetic template. And all three of those will be stabilized with anchor pins. Now, why do we want to place anchor pins in this particular case? Well, we want to for a very simple reason. Uh, we're gonna use uh, as part of our stability, the implants in number three and 14 position and, and use that to stabilize uh, all of our guides. What's gonna happen when you drill your osteotomies in the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 areas is you're gonna press down on that surgical template regardless of how easy you try to be. And that's gonna result in the osteotomy coming out slightly to the facial. And as you and those of you who do restorative dentistry know, that's basically death because you end up with your emergence profile someplace that you have to correct in the lab and that's not what you want. So what these anchor pins are going to do is they're going to give us stability in the anterior, mesial distally, coronal apically, so that we can go in and place our uh, osteotomies in exactly the pl same place that we want to. And really, the, the real big thing here is that one of the biggest problems we've had is now asking our restorative dentist to come in and pick up this uh, prosthetic uh, device early on, either the day of or the day after. What the anchor pins are going to do is make that incredibly simple in relation to what we had before. Mm -hmm. Now, 
That's interesting. So for, ah, there we go. Uh, so uh, here is the anchor guide template. Uh, you can see that there's gonna be an anchor uh, template in the number seven position. There's gonna be one in the 10 position and there's gonna be one in mid palette. So here we should have an anterior and then a right and a left view of that. The next thing is our surgical guide. So Dr. Wilson, we have a question from the audience actually, um, in regards sure. to the anchor pin guide, they're asking what is the best way to accurately place the anchor pins in a dentulous patient? Wow, that's hard. Uh, first of all, you need to have the most stable impression you can get. Uh, there are several ways to do that. In years past, one of the things we did is we placed so-called uh, uh, reduced diameter implants and used that to initially stabilize the denture, okay? That's probably the most accurate way to do it. Uh, you can try to rely on a really well-taken uh, soft tissue impression. Uh, there's always the possibility that things are going to move after you do that. So the, the most stable way to do it is to place usually a tripod of uh, these reduced diameter implants, one say in the first molar area, one up somewhere in the eight or nine area, uh, and then use it to stabilize the denture uh, that you then go through the same steps that we went through here in terms of planning. Okay, so here is the provisional with uh, anchor pins in place. I've got a deficit of soft tissue on the facial of tooth number 11, and also a deficit of soft tissue on the facial of tooth number uh, eight, excuse me, nine and 10. And so I'm gonna take a subepithelial connective tissue graph from the upper right, and you can see I'm gonna use that in a few minutes uh, for uh, my uh, approach. Now, here's the thing. Whether you've done eight million of these or whether you've done none, it's very disconcerting about what's on first, what's on second. Well, one of the really cool things about what they're doing at Implant Concierge is they're gonna tell you exactly what to do step by step. And I'll show you that as we go along. Uh, the first thing they do is they say, okay, well, here's what we're sending you. We're sending, sending you an anchor pin guide. We're sending you a surgical guide that, that again is held in with anchors and also a provisional bridge that's held in in the same way. Then the next thing they're gonna do in this particular case, in order to get an anchor pin in number 10, we gotta take number 10 out. And so what's the first thing that says on the guide? It says, take out number 10, okay, you do that. The next thing now, what we've done is we've left the remaining teeth that would be at this point, nine, uh, 11 and 12, uh, so that that's gonna stabilize our anchor pin. This would serve the same thing as the uh, reduced diameter implants uh, would serve if you were doing this uh, in a totally edentulous arch. And so we're gonna use this to place our anchor pins. So and here's Dr. our Wilson, anchor... uh, I'm sorry. And I was just gonna mention Dr. Wilson that uh, Lauren was having some technical difficulties, but she should be up and ready to go if you wanted to demonstrate those implants and anchor pins in the planning software. Hey, let's do that, yeah. All right, so let me go ahead and switch it over to Lauren. There we go. Now it's letting me do what I wanted to do. Okay, can everyone hear me? And can everyone see my screen? Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, so let me um, move this over just a hair here for you guys. Now, this is the treatment planning screen that I was showing you previously. Um, this is the combing CT that Dr. Wilson and Dr. Stewart provided registered in with the model that was provided as well. And I'll go ahead and just rotate this up for you so you can take a look. This is the model that was provided before tooth number or root number four was removed, five, six, seven, and eight were removed. Uh, it's also the model before number 10 was fractured. So what this model provides for us at Implant Concierge is the ability to see what the patient looked like prior to extraction. And we can use this 
to assist us and you in treatment planning as a restorative model. So yes, number four is broken. We could put in a, a, a quick tooth there for you or, um, or you could provide a wax up for that particular area. But what we can use this model for is as that um, scanning appliance like Dr. Wilson and Dr. Stewart use, we can use that in lieu of the scanning appliance. We don't really need that necessarily anymore, but it is a great radiographic tool if you're just looking at comb beam CT. But from treatment planning standpoints with a 3D software, this works great as well. Um, so what we've done is we, we have registered this in. It gives us that information of what the patient looked like prior to too much change, and we can use that to evaluate the angulation and position of our implants. Um, so what I'll go ahead and do here, too, is show you the different models that we were able to bring in. I'll turn that one off. This is the model after the patient had fractured tooth number 10 and after socket pre preservation was done uh, between 4 and, and 9. Uh, this gives us an accurate identification of what that ridge looks like post-healing. Um, and, and also to help us build that anchor pin surgical guide on accurate tissue and dentition. Now, yes, of course, it shows the tooth root number 10, and we're going to remove that prior to seeding our anchor pin guide, uh, but that's you know just a little hiccup in this particular view. Um, and then lastly, I can show you also our model that would be used for the surgical guide. And you kind of saw a few of those slides when Dr. Wilson was presenting while I was trying to get back online here. This is the model we'll use to create that second piece to the um, the connect guide that we provide. and that would, would, of course, fit on the existing tooth number, numbers 2 and number 15, existing implants 3 and 14, and then here on the edentulous ridge. So I'll go back really quickly to show our original model, and I will turn on our lower as well. And we can take a look in three dimension as well at what Dr. Wilson and Dr. Stewart were talking about before in regards to the patient's occlusion and um, interocclusal spacing. Um, I think you guys wanted to say a little bit of something about that. Yes. Nathan, so, I'll let you comment. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the lower overdenture, yeah, I think at this time I was about seven years old. Um, so we'd lost a lot of vertical in that direction. Um, you know, underneath that appliance, you know, you would have some nearly 20 year old tissue level implants. So there is a little limit there in um, how far we down we can bring um, the mandibular teeth. So, you know, as opposed to doing, you know, a hybrid style appliance on the upper versus what we chose to do with Crown and Bridge, um, we do, we get the benefit of needing a significantly smaller amount of interocclusal space. Um, so, you know, conventionally for, for a Crown and Bridge type case, you know, you need seven millimeters, you know, which with her having the, the natural teeth that we have, we definitively have that even in increasing her vertical dimension by making her a new lower overdenture. Um, one thing we didn't mention earlier is this patient does have a high smile line. Um, so again, to do some sort of hybrid type appliance, you know, you have to, to have to raise that transition line above the smile line, um, which is a significant amount of, amount of bone reduction. So, um, a few reasons why we've proceeded from here, the way that we have. Go ahead, Mark. All right, so I'll go ahead and turn off our posing really quickly here, and I'll turn back on our bone, and we'll go into the main view of our treatment planning software. So if you're used to using a 3D treatment planning software in your office, you probably understand these views a little bit, but you may not understand this software, so just kind of walk you through like I would if you were working with us for the first time. Uh, we have our cross-sectional images here, and this, of course, can be rotated around depending on where we want to look in the arch. We have our axial view where we can go up and down through the patient's arch. And then here, this particular software has a view called tangential. We really like this view because it gives us the ability to center on an implant and rotate in 360 degrees around that implant, allowing us to see the adjacent dentition, the distances between adjacent dentition, and so on and so forth. It also provides us the pano. Not a, gr a great fan of pano with 3D uh, treatment planning, but it is there for those of us who like to take a look at it. First, I'm going to, and then just stop me if you want me to do something different, Dr. Wilson or Dr. Stewart. I'll go ahead and start with our implants that were already in place for the patient. And what we've done is we've taken a digital replica of exactly the implant that was placed there and, and superimposed it 
on the radiograph. That way we can see what it looks like as, it, as we um, look at it in three dimensions at the occlusal, so how is it emerging, but then also we can use it to help us treatment plan the remainder of the case. So let me zoom in on these two screens really quickly. I like these a lot. Again, that tangential view. This is implant number three. We can see the, the uh, location of implant number three relative to the crown. Okay, we, you can see our blue model here that you were looking at in our 3D, 3D mode. And then here's that implant in a more of like a bite wing view, but this view also allows us to rotate around 360 degrees. So we really like this view a lot because we can take that complete rotation and look at our adjacent dentition. Okay, uh, same thing with number 14. We can go ahead and take a look at that as well and its orientation and emergence relative to its adjacent dentition. For giggles today, let's take a look at implant number nine, Dr. Wilson, and we can make some measurements and changes uh, if you would like. Uh, first, let me go ahead and show you back here. Let's go ahead and turn on all of our implants. This is the initial treatment plan that we have created using the data provided. And I'll just open this up full screen for you. And we can rotate this around and take a look at everything. And you can see how our existing implants, where they are relative to what we're trying to accomplish. This information is provided to us at Implant Concierge by the clinician via a tooth chart. You'll tell us we want six implants in the maxillary arch, and we would like them in these particular tooth positions. On our end, we would take that information and translate it into what you're seeing here in the best possible initial treatment plan. That's without your input as far as measurements and distances and lengths of implants. You can give us some of that information, but usually this particular stage is presented from a treatment, an initial treatment planning standpoint with not, without a lot of input from you. Why does that matter? Well, we want to talk with you to make sure that we get these implants in exactly the position that you and your colleague want, uh, but we don't want to spend all that time doing working this case up with you on the line. We want to have something presented so our, our meeting uh, is as effective and um, efficient as possible. So this would be our initial treatment plan. Or I want to re reiterate there, Lauren and I originally did all of our own planning in my office, and I can tell you it's a lot easier to do it this way than the other way. Uh, Nathan, you might want to talk a little bit about why you place the implants where you place them in terms of final restorations. Yes, so so we decided, um, you know, because of the angulation of the number three existing implants, um, you know, and the potential osteotomy site for the number five implant, that would be a, you know, a good spot to, um, you know, save the patient little finances and go with a a bridge on the upper right. Um, you know, the existing implant on the upper left, you know, that that was not going to be um, as predictable of an option. So um, from there, we decided to do with you know, three by five, um, and then a six by eight, and nine by 11, and then 12 and 14 be individual um, units. Um, and again, that was that was just a lot of conversations with the patient. And then, you know, and then all the way up, that was our, our initial plan. And then in meeting with um, Tom and Lauren, you know, we were able to make sure that that was the best viable plan. Uh, in it. And, and so and the you, really powerful thing here is that oftentimes we will have the restorative dentist, the surgeon, and in some cases that's going to be the same person, uh, the person from implant concierge and a lab person all on uh, a go-to-meeting site all at the same time. It, it, that's incredibly powerful, plus the fact you don't have to leave your office to do it. Uh, and you can uh, make sure that everybody is happy before the final treatment plan is made. Then once the final treatment plan is made, then literally implant concierge sends you an email and you sign off on that uh, and go from there. One of our favorite things to do is to have this meeting with our doctor and their restorative doctor and maybe the lab, like Dr. Wilson was mentioning, the more people, well, not always the more, but the more people we have on a meeting, um, the more interaction we can have and make sure that we're, we're touching base for everyone and, and meeting everyone's needs. Uh, we can do a meeting all day long with just one, one person of that group, but to have Dr. Stewart's input and say, you know, I'd really like that implant to be angled just a little bit differently because that will help me here. That's, 
that's great. And maybe not all the information that we would have with just a single person doing that, that meeting with us. So for today, just to kind of show you how this all works, I think we'll take a look at an immediate extract, immediate place implant, and that way we can make a couple of changes. I think we'll start at least with number nine, if that's okay, Dr. Wilson, and um, we can make some modifications to that, maybe go to another implant site as well if you want to look at a couple different ones with the group today. Well, it, it looks to me like we might be able to gain just a little bit more bone. Uh, would you agree with that, Lauren? I would. Okay. I would. Uh, what is that, a, is, that a, is that a 10 right now? This is actually, let's see here, this is a 12 by 3.3. 3. Um, we could grab a little bit more additional bone. Um, we have it placed slightly palatal of the extraction socket, but we can scooch it a little bit more palatal if you'd prefer. I can take a measurement here at the crest of the implant and let you know what that distance is if, you, if you're if you interested there. Um, well, the, the main thing here is... Nathan, are you planning to do a screw retain prosthesis or are you planning to do a cement retain prosthesis? So we're planning total screw retain. So I, I like the access where it is. I mean, could it go a skosh palatal? I mean, that would be fine, but I wouldn't want to take it too far palatal because then that's going to make our, our crown, um, you know, wider from the palatal to the, to the facial. Yeah, that's good. That would interfere phonetically, but you, there's a sweet spot right in there. I think it, I think it might be just slightly palatable to where it is. And if the implant could be a little bit longer and grab a little bit more bone, I think that would be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do this. Let's start with the distance and make sure that we're happy and what we want to maybe compromise toward. I've got a bow placed right at a millimeter from that palatal border. Um, so we can scooch it half millimeter or Two tenths of a millimeter, somewhere in that that regard. What would work for you guys, Nathan? Yeah, I think I think up to a millimeter would be perfect um, in the palatal direction. Uh, looks good to me. All right. So right at the apex, you can see where. And let me turn our implant off really quickly. You can see where that that existing tooth root starts and stops. Um, but when we put our implant on, you can see that we do engage in that native bone apical to the implant site. And I'll do that measurement for you as well, about three millimeters. So you'll have some initial stability apically, as well as toward that palatal side of the implant. And of course, this we're, one of the things we're trying to do is immediate placement, immediate load. This is going to factor into which implants we're going to load immediately. Yes. And I remember, we do load this one. So yeah, we did we did get quite a bit of stability on that one, even being an immediate. Yes. Let's take a look at one of our grafted sites, and that way we can see a little bit of a difference. Is there one you prefer, six, eight, or five? Nathan, I'll let you pick. Um, I guess we can look at six. Yeah. Look at six. Let's do it. Actually, let's five, because five, we were trying to line up with uh, number three. Okay. All right. So number five, this is a 10 by 4.1, and I'll zoom in here on those two treatment planning screens again. Let me turn off number six really quickly, just so it doesn't, does not um, confuse us here. Why is that one? And again, you know, with number three being a cemented crown, you know, as a restorative dentist, it, it's it's hard to gauge, um, you know, the actual inclination um, of the implant itself through two dimensional films um, without removing the crown. So, you know, being able to do that saved us a, and, and the patient a little bit of a headache of trying to wrestle that crown off there, um, you know, preoperatively. So it's very valuable. So this is implant number five and implant number five here as well. And you can see our existing implant number three. And what you're saying, Dr. Stewart, is you are trying to get that as close to parallel as possible with number five since these would be restored as a fixed unit, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Great. So the bone here is, um, you can see a little bit of, de of the definition here. And just to kind of quickly point out too, let me turn off this model and the implant just for a moment. You can see that radiographic template that was used. So both both sides come into play here. We can use both to help us treatment plan, um, but w because it's a little bit 
different view here than what we were seeing previously with out of tooth. I wanted to point out what that white material was that is that barium sulfate that was used in the radiographic template. We'll turn on our implant again here. So we have that border of our, of our uh, maxillary bone here in the number five position. Um, this is a 10 by 4.1. a little bit more for you. Here to the sinus floor, and we could have done that measurement in the previous view to the nasal floor as well. I'm getting about a millimeter and a half. Um, we could go a little bit shorter. We could keep it here um, a little bit longer if you want to engage a little bit more in that cortical bone up here. Um, we're already touching as we move towards the, uh, the distal here. We're already engaging in that sinus floor a little bit. Um, how does that position work? Restoratively, I think that was fantastic. Surgically, that's fine. I, I, it has been my experience that you actually have a little bit more cortical bone than shows up on the uh, CBCT, so I'm fine there. And then aside from talking about implants, of course, the next important thing that we would discuss would be our sleeves. And we don't need to do that today, I don't think, unless you guys want to do that. But you can see a replication here digitally of what that surgical sleeve would look like and its position within the case as well, so that you can determine if it's impinging on soft tissue or if it's impinging on adjacent dentition. Um, that is an, another component of the guided surgical meeting that we would have with you guys, uh, the VIP meeting with you guys, to determine what you want to do with your sleeves. You want to raise them up or or sink them down? Do you want to make it narrower? Um, are you going to do a flap? Or are you not going to do a flap? All of those details get discussed during that VIP meeting. Once you have completed the case with us, as far as finalizing the treatment plan anyway, um, I'll go ahead and turn these guys back on so we can look. We would take that information and, and, and send it over to our design crew. And at that point, someone would take this information they, they and I would talk or sometimes even pull in the clinician for a separate, separate meeting provided they have additional questions for how um, a prosthesis might be delivered after the implants are placed. And they, we take this information and, and generate that surgical guide for you. And I think we've got some pictures of that in Dr. Wilson's presentation. Oh, I think I've already seen. So Lauren, Dr. Wilson, um, obviously this is a case that y'all planned together previously. So I think this would be a good opportunity uh, to get some of our audience involved in the planning process because we're having some really great questions coming in through the chat right now. Uh, so one of the questions okay. being addressed was, uh, was the bite vertical occlusion and wax up based on the snap on smile? In this instance, no, no, it was not. Um, we used that kind of as a to find out how much wiggle room you know her joint could tolerate. Um, but in this position, you know, we we really liked the aesthetics of um, at least from a from a screw retained access standpoint, um, the position of her natural teeth, her midline was good. So for the planning purposes, we we used her pre-op model um, before the surgery that she had on the upper right side um, for implant positions. And then and subsequently we used um, some of the snap on smile information um, for her final restorations. Great. Um, and this for Dr. Wilson and Lauren, uh, we have a doctor wanting to discuss number eight in a little bit more detail. Um, this doctor noticed that on the barium, it showed lack of buckle bone and how is the angu angulation handled in terms of the final restoration design? Lauren, do you want to go back to your screen and uh, discuss that? Sure. Can you see it? It should be up here. Site number eight. Everyone good? So this is site number eight. This is a 3.3 by 10. I'm, I'm showing now the opposing model so you can see that as well. Uh, so the question was, what, is, what was done because of the minimal facial bone here? Is that correct, Andy? Yes. Let's go ahead and, and open this one up too and I'll, I'll turn off our opposing so we can take a look. So we're, the plan is to splint number three and number five and then Remind me, it was six through eight and then nine through 11, correct? And then these two remain individuals. Um, yes, so what we, what we were trying to accomplish is to keep these guys relatively parallel to one another. 
uh, and I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, additional grafting would be done at the time of surgery. Is that correct? Uh, there was a soft tissue graft that was tunneled through, but uh, there was no more hard tissue graft that was done, if I remember correctly. But I did it three years ago. And I've slept since then. Just once or twice. So let's see here. Where's my apologies? Sometimes this kicks over to a different screen. Now, are we discussing number eight or number nine? Eight. Okay. Eight. The question was for eight, right, Andy? Yes, ma'am. So okay. Eight because and we're six, gonna, we were trying to get nine, We're going to handle number nine very differently, as you will see in a few minutes. So we were trying to get those relatively parallel, provided the anatomical constraints that we have in that number eight site. Um, and as you can see here, this has a lovely tool that allows us to determine how divergent implants are. And these two are 5.4 degrees divergent from one another. So they're not parallel, but they're pretty close. And within the, the seven or 10 degree tolerance that we would treatment plan your implants or, or you guys would ask us to treatment plan implants um, between. So somewhere between seven and 10 degrees um, parallel or off parallel from one another is, is the maximum tolerance there. Um, so I think this is not exactly the final, final treatment plan. We've played with it quite a bit. Um, but this is pretty close to what we ended up with. Did that answer the question, Andy? Do you know? We will see if you have any additional questions in regards to that. Definitely feel free to submit it. Um, in the meantime, we do have another question. Just um, a couple of questions. If you could just once again go over the restorative plan for this case. There's a couple of questions in regards to um, you know, what bridges or crowns you're planning on placing, if any multi-unit abutments are being used, um, you know, why not have number four as a cantilevered pontic? So if you could just quickly um, review once again what the, the final restorative plan for this case is going to be. Yes, yeah, so the, yeah, the final plan, um, again, so posterior bridge, three by five on the upper right, um, two anterior bridges, six to eight, nine to 11 and then posterior units. Um, you know, multi-unit abutments are going to be utilized for the provisional, um, you know, that, that just makes life easy. Um, so no reason not to do that. Um, multi-unit abutments are not available for the tissue level implants, so those will be engaging on the provisional. Um, the reason for, for, not, for not cantilevering is we wanted to utilize the existing implants for posterior support in the provisional. Um, so in that regard, if we cantilever it off that, we would have our provisional only resting on our fresh implants, um, you know, with three of those being immediates. So neither, I, I, I would not feel comfortable with that. And I, I imagine Dr. Wilson, you, you would agree. I, I'm not a fan of cantilevers in that situation, no. So, so that was that's the reason um, behind behind our decision there. Um, but yeah, the final plan is is just pretty much bridges aside from um, individual units on that posterior upper left segment. Awesome! Thank you so much. And I'm currently reading through some of the other questions right now. I have a question, uh, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Stewart. Um, can you comment about the of, of why you chose to do a series of bridges versus just a single arch? I'll, I'll let Nathan talk about that. Okay. Um, so, uh, as opposed to using multi-unit abutments and doing one hybrid, is that is that the question? That's correct. Uh, doing a series of series of, of bridges versus one one full full house round house well, uh, i mean first firstly i mean hygiene um yeah if, i think if if we all had had our choice um you know in being experts in doing what we do and working in the field that we work i feel like we'd all prefer something that we could we could floss um to the best of our ability um 
so that was that's one consideration. Um, you know, the the second consideration is also space and preservation of the alveolar structures. Um, so, if you know, if we were going to do a one piece sitting on multi unit abutments, you know, we need space for the multi unit abutment, and then we need certain amount of of you know strength in that. Assuming we do a zirconia appliance, um, you know, you'd need. I mean, you're going to need 15 millimeters of inner arch space, which we just don't have in this case um, without doing a significant amount of bone reduction. So, um, again, we spent lots of time, um, you know, discussing the options with the patient, and and she ultimately made that decision um, on to, to be in this way. So, I mean, again, it, that's an easy easy one to guide her with because, again, I'd say most of us, if we had our our, our option, we would probably choose choose that option as well. Well, the other, the other thing that's relevant here, too, is that not so much in this case, but we have a bruxer here, and especially yeah. if she was against something a little stronger in the mandible, uh, you have to deal with fractures. And uh, it, it's a lot easier to just take off a three unit bridge that's already screwed in and, and put some porcelain on it uh, than it is to take out that whole unit. It also figures into provisionalization along those lines. And so, yeah, we, we just like submetal bridges when we can get them. Mm -hmm. Keeps it simple in the future. Awesome. So, uh, a lot of these questions are surgical questions, so we'll go ahead and leave those since right now we're just covering over the planning aspect and we'll we'll jump into the actual surgery in a little bit. So I guess the final questions to address prior to moving on um, is we just have uh, a couple of questions about um, someone is asking why the need for the barium sulfate is not the abilities of, you know, the CBCT imaging sufficient, um, the CBCT and digital impression. Well, we're basically using belt and suspenders here, okay? We want to have as many views as we can of the final uh, restoration in relation to that uh, osteotomy site. And so what we found over time, we used to use barium impregnated teeth, denture teeth, but they're not available anymore. So what we do now is we take a vacuum form, we fill it with a combination of 85% acrylic and 15% barium, uh, let that set up, and then uh, make 3.5 millimeter openings in the sites where we want the osteotomy to come through in the final restoration. And that shows up on the radiograph. And so then Lauren has got something to aim that digital impact. And it has just been really, Fantastic from, from our standpoint. It really helps in guessing where in that crown you want your osteotomy to come through. Just more accuracy. It's kind of hard to see in this particular view uh, because barium does exactly what you see here. It can sometimes get a little funky and, and, and cause some scatter. Um, but the hole that he's referencing is this right here. It's, because I've worked so closely with Dr. Wilson for for a long time, um, I've been on the opposite side. I've been on the chair side side with him, and then today here. Um, before we had 3D treatment planning, it was used so that, and even once we had 3D treatment planning, um, it was used as an instant verification of okay, I do or I don't have bone here. I'm going to have to modify my plan. Even before this meeting occurred. We could see that hole and say, okay, this isn't going to work here because there's not enough bone here. Or, you know what, it has to go here, and I see I don't have bone, so I have to plan ahead of time and talk to my patient about doing bone grafting. So even before having the, the VIP meeting on the case to plan implants, with the information coming back directly from the Comium CT uh, machine, it gave an instant verification, if you will, of what was and wasn't available. For the treatment planning side, it's not necessarily um, needed, but it is, like he said, belt and suspenders work together. I hope that answers that question well. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so as I mentioned, let's go ahead and continue with the presentation, wrapping up the treatment planning. I think um, given the amount of questions we're having, people are eager to see the, the execution of this treatment plan. Okay. All right, so now we've got our anchor pin template. 
And all you do, this is basically just an osteotomy. Uh, you make sure that your template fits the way it's supposed to fit. Uh, you take your uh, drill, you go through until it hubs out and take it out. And then you do that three times. Then you remove this template. And so now we're going to place the surgical template. But before we place the surgical template, we've got to take out tooth numbers 9, uh, 10, excuse me, 9, 11, and 12. Number 10 had been previously removed. So we're going to put the surgical template in. We're going to put the surgical template in. And we're going to place our anchor guide pins. Just slip them in right into the osteotomy sites. And what that does is it gives you coronal apical stabilization. And it gives you mesial distal stabilization as well because of the pal mid-palatal stent. And all of that says that right here. It says what we're supposed to do. We're going to take out 9, 11, and 12. We're going to secure it with the anchor pins. Uh, and then we're going to start to place our implants. Now, back to the surgical planning part of this, you'll see the metallic circles. Those are five millimeters in diameter. And uh, we're going to use some drill guides that will reduce those down to a 2.2, a 2.8, a 3.5, and then whatever other drills we're going to use. In other words, just a typical guided uh, approach. So now we have our surgical guide uh, that is stabilized and we're going to do our osteotomies. Uh, for those of you who do these, you know, there's a guide up there that tells you the length of burr to use. It tells you the, the height of the, uh, of the uh, drill handle guide to use as a one and a three in this particular situation. And here we're using guided implants so that we have a better chance getting the implants uh, at the correct position, mesial distally, buccolingually, and more importantly, coronal apically. So here's all the mishmash after we do all of that stuff. We've got the implant insertion devices in, uh, the anchor pins are still in. We take all of those out and this is what we get. So we have now immediates in number nine, uh, number 11, uh, and number 12, in, in number 10, uh, you can see that there is a deficit of soft tissue on the facial of number 11. There was some gingival recession there. There's also a minimal band of keratinized gingiva on the facial of uh, spaces 9 and 10. So I'm going to tunnel my graph, uh, soft tissue graph, from 11 all the way through 9, and I'm going to put it on the facial. Then we're going to place our implants. And once we place our implants, because of the way we planned our extraction sites, we know that we have at least two millimeters of horizontal space between the implant, si uh, the implant uh, itself, the implant body, and the uh, socket wall. That's called the horizontal defect dimension, and we know that if you don't graph that area, that dimension is going to fall in and you're going to get recession. So we're going to graph that again with the combination of, uh, of freeze-dried bone and enamel matrix derivative. And then we're going to walk out of the room. I'm going to go smoke cigarettes and drink coffee and uh, talk with my friends while I turn all the hard part over to Nathan. <laughs> Not too many cigarettes, though, I hope. Not too um, many cigarettes, that's right. <laughs> And then I guess, I guess technically, you know, we're probably one slot back from this, you know, whenever, you know, the implant crowns on three and 14 are still on there before that cigarette and um, the multi-unit abutments aren't on yet. So I don't think you want me, um, you know, messing with the surgery sites with the soft tissue until we've already picked up that appliance. So, so at this, in this uh, point here, we've removed um, the implant crowns from the tissue level implants on the three and 14 site. Um, you know, those if the solid abutments, you know, sometimes that can be that can be trying. Um, but those are off. And then uh, we used all straight multi-unit abutments because of the way the case was planned. Um, there's minimal divergence on the bone level implants. So we were able to uh, torque those um, though those that torqued out to 35 Newton centimeters are the ones that we felt comfortable um, loading immediately. 
that was the um, existing implants as well as the implant at the five site, the eight site, and then the 11 site. I misspoke earlier. I, we weren't able to load the number nine implant. I think it did start to, it wanted to twist a little bit whenever we were putting the multi-unit abutment on. So we, we left that one alone. Um, we'll go to next slide for me. So once the multi-unit abutments are in position, um, we were able to uh, try and our um, temporary cylinders. Um, again, those those you just torque with a prosthetic screw to 15 newton centimeters. Um, the tissue level um, implants do not have any multi-unit, so those are actually engaging cylinders. Um, with that, uh, we had to trim. You know, you'll find again this 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 guide or this this provisional has to fit over all of these to, to seat all the way down to where we can use our stabilization pins um, to hold everything in position. So we had to trim trim those sleeves a little bit. Uh, this is, at this time, this is my first time doing this. We've had the lab do this for us in the past. Um, so what I learned in doing this was that you should pre-trim the cylinders. Um, if you cut those down, it would have made life a little bit easier and this all go a little bit quicker. Um, so picture on the right, we have all the temporary cylinders in place. The uh, cylinders are trimmed to where the provisional slides over the top of those. So we can go to the next slide. And at this point, again, we still have our instructions. So it's still, again, so at this point, you know, you need to put the provisional in, get the, get the guide pins in place. And what we had the benefit of for the surgical guides was we had the crowns and the, and the existing teeth posteriorly to anchor that posteriorly. In this instance, the only thing that's anchoring this three-dimensionally are those, are those pins. Um, the palatal pin in this case, I believe uh, Dr. Wilson planned to put this right in the mid palatal suture. So that thing, that thing was was in there very, very, very tight, um, which which really gave that really good stability. How it's tripoded. Um, so at this point, went ahead, um, we could have the patient close together again without having the stackable guides. But subsequently to this, you know, we've used those systems. Um, yeah, it, that's a mouthful. Um, so you, you know, trying to get the patient to you know, to articulate and see if you're in the ballpark, very difficult. And this instance, it's pretty clean. You know, this this pretty well sits in the final position that it'll it'll stay in. Um, so so we were able to close together, see that we were we were in the right ballpark. We were hitting on a few of the temporary cylinders that still needed to be trimmed, but um, but we we could see that the pre-op plan followed through to the um, to the provisional. So at that time, um, we're able to just loot each cylinder. Um, in this instance, I uh, just use a little bit of flowable composite, just enough to, to bond to the provisional as well as pick up um, the cylinders. At that time, the um, anchor pins can then be removed, can untorque the prosthetic screw, and the provisional can then be removed, finished in the lab. We can interrupt Dr. Wilson's uh, coffee break and get him back in there to, to do his, his connective tissue grafting and all the fancy stuff. Um, and I believe actually in this process, I feel like, yeah, I think I think we wound up putting a, a healing abutment on the number 12 implant because it, it was a little bit unstable as well. So it, it was sleeping underneath this appliance. Um, so after everything was trimmed, um, cylinders trimmed down, we used um, acrylic, um, some packable acrylic in the, the access holes for the implants that we were not able to immediately load in this instance. Um, and then that appliance was was torqued to 15 newton centimeters. We just used a lot, utilize a little bit of um, impression material, PPS, in those access holes. That's easily retrievable um, once the patient's healed. And and uh, then then I get to have my coffee. Yeah, yeah. I think we have another. We have another. Um, this is a couple of the implants that we're not able to load. Again, that number 12 implant, we went ahead and put a healing abutment on that one. Um, and then you can kind of see the way the, the composite, you know, that's going to, where that's picked up around the cylinders. And then the next slide, please. Um, so this is this is immediate, immediate post-op with the provisional in place. 
Um, after this, we did adjust a little. We we're going to replace the lower overdenture, so able to uh, to adjust the occlusion more so on the lower um, than the upper. And then we saw the patient for regular recall in our office to ensure that most of that occlusal support um, is falling on those 12 year molars and those existing implants posteriorly, leaving her with a slight uh, anterior open bite. Just to, to mitigate the risk, especially with her brexing, um, also asked her to sleep without her lower appliance, which she'd been doing for years. Um, so asked her to to avoid that, uh, especially in those first three months um, after the, the surgery was done. Uh, let's see what we have next here. So this is one week post-op. Um, Dr. Wilson, if you want to comment at all on, on the look of the tissue there, well, as you would expect, the, the area where we had a lot of recession on the facial of number 11 looks a little uh, a little uh, hamburgerish, but uh, that'll work out over time. So, right. and we go to the next slide. This uh, this is just something that that, I've, that we've kind of found in these cases is is one, uh, I guess you could say, downside um, in the. You know the the crown and bridge segment um, of a provisional is that you you have a thin acrylic provisional. Um, so in a patient who clenches and um, I believe while she was wearing this provisional, she made she went on a cruise and she went to Jamaica and sent me pictures of her eating jerk chicken and drinking margaritas. So <laughs> things happen. Um, and with that, you know, I, I think every month, you know, we we kind of patch the 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 provisional a little more. Um, you know. Brett and I have discussed, you know, future cases, you know, it may be worth taking a quick compression uh, post-surgically to have the ability to make a backup appliance. Um, you know, having those back doors built in, even to the provisional stage, uh, would probably make our life uh, a little bit easier easier going forward. Um, but that's just just something just to be mindful of in, in that in that provisional phase. <laughs> Um, so again, I don't have a lot of um, a lot of photos of the restorative phase in this case. Um, it's, it's still ongoing with the pandemic. Uh, we still don't have um, final post-op photos, but we were able to uh, make custom imprint impression copings and the anterior implants uh, open tray impression using floss and incremental flowable um, to stabilize the copings. Um, and then go to the next slide, please. Um, to to our to give the the lab the information that we've gained in the provisional um, as far as midline tooth length um, you know vertical dimension um, you know after the the models fabricated then we can take the provisional off mount that on the model index mm -hmm. the model um, and then take a putty matrix um, of the provisional on the model that way the laboratory can then make us a, a an acrylic mock-up. Um, so that then we can sit down in the lab and work out any kinks from there. Well, one of the things that we found post-op is that uh, my responsibility is to take post-operative uh, photographs. Uh, for some reason, I thought that Nathan was doing it, and I think Nathan thought I was doing it. So we have these, and that's all we have. And and these this is the this is the first try in we haven't we haven't yet actually we've since then we've finished a new lower overdenture um, we just took these photos to communicate with the lab changes that we needed to make um, but but you can get the gist of um, you know the 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 final final restorations are gold hue titanium custom abutments with zirconia screw retained um, you know crowns and bridges um, flossable cleansable. Um, doesn't feel like we built a house in her mouth, um, you know, from a from a bulk standpoint, um, and she's she's very happy. I have to take our word for it. Well, that's all we have from an organized standpoint, but we're happy to stay as long as there is interest to answer questions about whatever we've talked about. So, Andy, do you have some questions for us? Yeah, there are quite a few questions that came through, so we'll go ahead and start firing them off, and then. Obviously, the floor is open for additional questions as well. So I encourage everybody to go ahead and um, submit any questions, concerns, ideas that they have from this presentation. Uh, but one of the first questions that came through is someone wants to know when to select a tissue level versus bone level implant. 
Hmm, that's a great question. Uh, as a surgeon, uh, a tissue level implant is is better if you're going to use it in the posterior. It's just more cleansable. Uh, you have the uh, the edge of the uh, abutment implant interface at or only slightly subgingivally, which makes it easier to clean. Uh, <clears throat> It, using a tissue level implant in the anterior in an aesthetic case is very difficult. Uh, and so if I have a choice, I'm going to use bone levels in the anterior or anywhere where I'm concerned about aesthetics. Uh, and in the posterior, especially in molars, I'm going to use a tissue level. We're restoring a question. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say we're restoratively, yeah, the, the bone level just provides more restorative space so it gives you wiggle room um and multi-unit abutments you know in a, in a case where you say okay something go right you lose an implant you have to put one in an non-ideal position if you have you know with tissue level implants you don't have um, as much working space to correct for angulation um in a, in a multi-unit case like this it's it's helpful to have as much space as you can get awesome uh, we have another another question asking: Was any bone profiling used during placement or after? No. And then the, uh, another question is: Did you harvest the CT graft from the palate or tuberosity? Would an allograft have worked? <laughs> I don't think we have enough time to really answer that question. Uh, I harvested from right palate, uh, basically from the uh, bicuspid area. Uh, she had very thick tissue there. Uh, if I'm going to place a graft, I'm going to use a soft tissue graft if I can in a position like this. Uh, nothing works as well as autologous tissue. So we have a question um, in regards to the provisional. Um, it was asked, why not just do an upper denture and come back to do the implants after healing? Um, they're concerned about the risk of loading the same day. You could. Yeah. That's perfectly okay. Uh, we felt that we had two small implants. That would be number three and number 14. What the same we did with that we would have at least three and possibly four of the uh, that we could torque to uh, uh, that we could love because that in our experience no problem if you want to go in and do the same thing on that we did on the mandible 20 years ago perfectly okay to do that there's good things about it there's bad things about it in this case, we've got a person who bruxes. Uh, it might be a problem with her placing some, some uh, undue pressure on our implants. Uh, you would want to be sure that you uh, bury those implants during the healing time. Uh, you certainly could do that. And if you feel more comfortable with that approach, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And, and yeah, from a, I guess, a restorative standpoint, um, you know, we'll you know, she's, she has something fixed. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, they, they don't want to be in a denture. Um, and again, that doesn't always guide our, our decision, but, um, you know, plan A would be, would be fixed if it's feasible. Um, and, it, and it helped having the upper right already being surgerized. So we knew those were going to be, um, relatively stable. Um, in addition, you know, I, on the final restorative, um, side of it, you know, it is easier to mitigate the soft tissue, on the immediate side where, where we did have um, something there to support the tissue and not have a denture sitting on the tissue, especially with the, with the areas that were grafted. So when, when we have the adequate support, um, it, it, it does make the, the, restore, the restorative side um, significantly less complex. And we have a question uh, specifically for you, Dr. Stewart. They're asking, what is your preferred method for verification jig or impression? Um, any, just about any multi, uh, multiple implant case, um, you know, if it's, if it's a 
you know, if it's a, a hybrid type case, a lot of times we'll have the laboratory fabricate a verification jig that then those will loot together. Um, in this instance, and I, I apologize for not having photos of that, but um, typically we'll just take floss and make make a make a 3D matrix with the floss um, between each impression coping um, and incrementally add global composite towards the middle, leave a small, small space, and then tack that together to, to prevent shrinkage and any sort of distortion. Um, so you're kind of making your own verification jig and then taking your PVS impression and going with that. And we have a question uh, regarding indexing the prosthesis on the model. They just wanted to, uh, if y'all could elaborate on, you know, what that means, what's the reasoning or what's the, the method behind that. Uh, is the, the indexing, again, you could scan that on the model. You know, at this time we didn't ha have a scanner in the office. So um, the indexing just gives, gives the lab the ability to have a, have a three dimensional stint that pops on to the final model. Um, so what they're able to do with that is actually fill that with acrylic, put that over the model, and then on the final model, we have a, an immediate duplicate of the provisional that engages into the implant. So pretty much they have a duplicate provisional in the laboratory. Uh, so all of a sudden photos and everything becomes a little bit uh, more useful out of the mouth. Um, so less patients for the less appointments for the patient. So another question is in regards to the implant placement in the number eight and nine area. Um, they're asking that they've heard placing implants in the number seven and ten sites allow for better midline papilla shape. What is y'all's experience in regards to that? Well, it depends on what kind of implants you're placing, uh, and it depends on the amount of room that you've got. One of the things we had here is, as I showed you in one of the radiographs, is we had a pretty large uh, incisive canal. So that means that those implants are going to be fairly parts. Uh, we know from Denny Karnauer's work that if you can get uh, the uh, edges of the implant three millimeters apart, the probability of having a, um, an interproximal papilla is pretty high. The other thing is this lady had a pretty flat periodontium, so you don't have to develop a really high scallop uh, interproximally. Uh, and the other thing, that's one of the reasons that I did the uh, subepithelial connective tissue graft uh, that brought some excess tissue on the facial of 11, uh, 9 through 11. But you, you got you got to do all those plans. And also, if you'll notice, we use three threes in the uh, three three diameter implants in the uh, two centrals. I don't have a problem with you going from um, from seven to 10, if we had done seven to 10 in this area, we just would have had to change one of the positions of one of our anchor pins, which is not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, I, bet, I mean, restoratively, I've, we've kind of done it both ways. It, it, it is, um, I guess everybody has their own method for that, but um, I, if in this instance, especially having um, have, having the, the canines present there, um, it, and the existing implants in place, it kind of worked out from a minimal number of implant standpoint um, to do it. To do it. Better. Nathan makes an incredibly good point. In this particular case, if you did a seven and ten and a six and eleven implant, probably the hardest places that we have to get those papillae to come would be between that cuspid and the lateral. So we, we try to avoid that if we can. So we have a question um, about when an immediate is placed and the implants aren't as stable as you would like. Um, if the temporary hybrid fractures and you end up having to remove it, um, there's a little bit of uh, anxiety about, you know, having to unscrew the implant. What are your comments and thoughts in that scenario? Um, luckily, you know, if the implant is not stable. Well, if you have an unstable implant, and, and I'll use highly technical terms here, uh, a spinner versus a flopper, okay? If you've got one that just sunk, you can keep pressure off of it, do a graft, do whatever you're going to do, leave it alone, bury it. If you've got a flopper, that means if it literally falls over, you better take it out. And if you take it out, you need to graft that site at that time. 
and yeah, and in this instance, we only only loaded the implants that would already torque to 35. So, um, you know, we didn't have any any um, spinners or or floppers. Um, but but there is, you know, if, if 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 the provisional were to break at two weeks, you know, that would be a discussion that you know I'd pick up the phone, call Dr. Wilson, and say, hey, do you feel comfortable with me removing this? More than likely, what we would do is we would we would split it together in the mouth and try to minimize, especially in that first kind of four week period, um, you know, the, the need to torque those at all. So on that note, we have a, a couple of questions about what is the minimum torque of an implant for immediate load, in your opinion, and do you use any Hostel or ISQ device? Uh, you know, I think I misspoke earlier. I said 65 newton centimeters. It's, it's 35 newton centimeters. Yeah, I've got three Ostels, actually. Um, I don't use them like I used to. Uh, I usually go by the torque that I feel when I place the implant. I don't place the implant uh, using a handpiece. I do it using a ratchet. And... It, there are ratchets that can tell you exactly how many newton centimeters you put those those in. If it's around uh, 35, we're minimal. In, uh, we're talking here multiple implants splinted together. I feel very differently about immediate place, immediate load, single implants. I don't do those. I've done those, and I've had enough failures. Uh, that I just don't do that anymore, okay? Can you do it? Absolutely. Do people do it all the time? Absolutely. If you do that, especially in the maxillary interior, be sure that uh, you control the occlusion. Be sure that you have a patient that understands that they have to stay away from that implant. And we would usually fabricate them a maxillary heart acrylic bite guard to wear at night uh, that did not touch the implant in, in any dimension. But at, I, I've done enough of those and had failures enough in, in enough of those that I just quit doing it a while ago because you you get some very, very unhappy patients because it's right back up again and again and you got to start all over and I just don't want to do that anymore. So we have a question directly for Dr. Stewart. What kind of training did you have, Dr. Stewart, for restoration and planning? Um. So I kind of have like probably all of us here, you know, we're kind of avid learners. So, um, you know, I did a one year postgrad um, AGD residency with the VA where we did a lot of comprehensive cases. Um, as soon as I got out, I joined as many study clubs as I could, um, one of which including, um, you know, getting guidance from great mentors like Dr. Wilson and um, the faculty at Spear and, uh, and then just grabbing on to as many people that, that know what they're doing so we can get on their level as quickly as possible. I, I have well, to say have that, that Dr. Stewart is an extraordinary young man and, and an incredibly good restorative dentist. Very kind. True. We, we have another question asking, were multi-unit abutments used in the final, final prosthesis? And if the posterior implants had not been present, how would have uh, would the treatment plan have changed? Um, I mean, I'd say yes. Yeah. So, so first question: No, no multi-unit abutments were utilized. Um, everything was an engaging um, custom, uh, gold hue custom abutment uh, with screw retained restorations. Um, so just segmented crown and bridge. Um, second question. Um, Maybe, you know, I mean, we all, you know, in, in a perfect world, we don't make decisions based off lost cost. But at some point, you know, especially we see it all the time, having treatment conversations with patients that have existing implants. Nobody wants to go through the cost and the time and the surgery to remove their implant, which, you know, if we we're going to, in this case, if we we're going to do some sort of hybrid, we would have to. I mean, we couldn't have utilized um, the implants that, that she had pre existing. So um, would we have done it differently? I mean, minor changes, um, but, and she would have had the option and maybe she would have, she had the option, but she may have considered another alternative um, and it definitely would have changed her provisionalization strategy. Um, you know, just, it, we would have, you know, probably been 
been more than 50-50 on whether she would wind up in some sort of uh, removable prosthetic um, during that. And we could have, you know, saved a couple teeth to make the snap on smile work, probably broken it up into two surgeries. Um, that way she maybe didn't have to go with the conventional venture. Um, but then we would, we could, we would definitely brainstorm if, if, if we didn't have the foundation that we had. Dr. Wilson, do you have any on that? Well, you know, there, there, there are several factors here. First, we'll talk about it much. Also retain the maxillary second molar. And if you look at that, uh, one week post op that Nathan had, he had the occlusion sort of sitting on those and the two implants. Yeah, it could have changed things. So, what could you have done? You could have taken out the teeth, you could have grown some bone, you could have put in a removable denture like we discussed uh, on the lower. Uh, what else could you have done? Uh, you could have also done it as a staged approach. Uh, Frank Higginbottom and I have done hundreds of these over the years where we go in and we take out selected teeth, put in provisional restorations that are fixed, uh, come back later, take out more teeth, put in more implants, and ult ultimately end up with some sort of a fixed appliance. So terribly different ways to approach it. Uh, in this particular situation, we had the advantage of having two good molar teeth and two good molar implants, so we simply took advantage of it. Awesome. Thank you. And I believe, uh, I think, Brett, you had some questions that you wanted to address as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me okay? I've been quiet, busy responding to questions as much as possible. My fingers are on fire right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, calm down and ask the question, Brett. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Wilson, um, I have a Dr. Cohen asked a question. He goes, patient is a smoker. Discuss the CT graft survival. Well, I, I buried the CT graft. Uh, it was a tunnel preparation, so the probability of that working. Now, you have to remember that the patient was a previous smoker. She smoked in 2000 uh, when she first presented. She stopped when she had her gastric bypass in 2013, and at least according to the patient, she has not smoked since then. So now let's turn the question around. What if she was a smoker? Uh, obviously, nothing works as well in people that smoke as they do in people that don't smoke. Okay. So a, another interesting uh, kind of side discussion that was going on and I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Dr. Um, Pran, Prankowski talks about your um, concern about the incisive canal, whereas from his standpoint, his training, um, he doesn't mind just obliterating the contents of the canal and then grafting sure. it, allowing the help with a more ideal position or placement. What is your opinion of the incisive canal? I got, I got no problems with doing that. Uh, people that I trust, guilt trip at other people do that all the time. I don't, I just don't feel comfortable with it. In this situation, it was not uh, something that I thought was gonna be particularly helpful based on the planning that we did, but lots of people do that. Uh, I got no problems. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody that's had a lot of trouble with it. It, it just, for some reason, I, I just prefer not to do that. All right. Okay, so I have another uh, another surgeon asked a question, Dr. Collins. He asked, Dr. Wilson, as a surgeon, um, if this case was a case that you would have no choice but to extract all the teeth, um, how would you have restored the day of the surgery? Um, would you have placed six implants and the buckle bone placement due to the minimum buckle bone? Um, so kind of address, if you didn't have those, those two uh, molar implants already in position, how would your treatment plan and your decision to provisionalize changed or would there have been changes? Well, let's take this case without the two uh, molar implants. Uh, we've got a lady who bruxes. We're gonna have a fair number of immediate placements. And so I would say to that individual at that point that I would have everything ready that we had ready 
at the time that we did this surgery. And that if we were able to get at least four uh, maxillary implants that we could torque to 35 and they were they had some reasonable distribution, then we would go ahead and load. Uh, if not, we would have told the patient that uh, we have a maxillary full denture that's ready. Uh, we will simply reline that. We will uh, get these implants where they will have minimal trauma and we'll go from there. Again, uh, this is, this lady's a little shaky because she has uh, she has a propensity to brux, but as Nathan said, she also takes out her lower denture at night, and, and she's she's been pretty good in general terms about doing what we ask her to until we got her fixed teeth, and then she sort of took off on her own. So I, I see the point, uh, but I would always couch it. If we can, we will do a fixed restoration. If we can't, then we have a backup ready that day. You know, it doesn't help also that uh, she loves beef jerky. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> She's a great lady. Yeah. Uh, Andy, can you have any more questions there? Let's see. There, there's a lot of questions in the queue, so we're trying to kind of scroll through these, but it's been... Uh, it's been really exciting. Been a lot of great discussion. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. So, so I have a question. You, Dr. Oh, go, go ahead, Andy. I was going to say there's a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that you preferred the, the hand piece. I mean, excuse me, the ratchet versus the hand piece. Uh, a doctor's just asking, is that mainly for the tactile sensation? Yeah, I actually, actually what I do for almost all of my implants, if I can, if I can get in there, is I put them in my, with my fingers first uh, into the osteotomy site. Uh, and then I take them down with my fingers as far as I can take them. And then I pull out the ratchet. Uh, I found that in some cases where you have class three, class four bone uh, in my hands, uh, when I used a handpiece to deliver the implant, you actually made the osteotomy site bigger, or in some cases you actually got the implant in the wrong position. And so I, I'm very, very careful when I put implants in, especially in the immediate sites, uh, because it's really easy to get those uh, out of position. So I, I take my time, usually fingers first, then the ratchet after that. Dr. Stewart, this question's for you, and it's, it's a, uh... I think it's a challenging question, but I think it's well worth asking, and it has to do a lot to do with, with how you address the patient. And since she already had implants in, in number three and also number 14, um, did you guys talk about the transition zone as far as the alveoloplasty? Uh, obviously, with leaving the implants there, you, we weren't able to reduce the bone, so it kind of limited us a little bit. But also, there is a, a balance there of the transition zone as well as uh, managing what she already had in place. How did that discussion go with the patient and what was that discussion like? Um, you know, that, that's a good, that's, that's a complex question. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah that, that, that was, that, you know, that discussion, it, it, you know, that, that's delicate too because you know, they, they don't necessarily know what we, so we can show models and we can discuss, but I mean, unless, unless you sit down and, and actually YouTube surgery, you know, they don't necessarily understand what that looks like to see that alveolar bone go away. Um, obviously, restoratively, you know, I mean, an appliance like that aesthetically is is easy because you have you have man made soft tissues. Um, so, you know, th there is a give and take there. Um, you know, ultimately, you know that that was just something that it, it, that she, we helped educate her to the point at which she wanted to, to make that decision. Um, you know, a lot of times patients will say that they'll say, you know, I want, you know, I, I want individual teeth. Um, and, you know, obviously Dr. Wilson, I mean, it's, that's not always, or hardly probably in no instance is that, is that the best option? Um, you know, 20 years ago, she may have made the same decision on the lower, but, but at that point, you know, it's not nearly as predictable as it is now. So that's a question she had often as well. Why can't we do this on the lower? And so well, we can, it just means we have to take out your existing implants and we'd have to start over. And then she goes, ah, no, <laughs> um, but they, thank you. Let's not do that. Well, it, it also has to do with philosophy. 
one of the things the periodontist does is it, they spend their lives trying to grow bone. <laughs> and we, if we can avoid cutting it all away, I think we feel more comfortable. I think it's a back door. The back door is that if you have bone, ultimately lose some implants, then you're still going to have bone to do some more implants later. I just philosophically feel more comfortable with that, especially. Andy, do you have any other questions? I'm scrolling through it right now. Uh, we actually have a question for Lauren um, asking for you to discuss in a little bit more detail the virtual wax up and the occlusion during the planning process and in the software. Uh, so depending on, so virtual wax up would be something that we would provide at Implant Concierge and what we would need in order to provide something of that nature is both your your arch of interest as well as your opposing arch and a bite. Uh, that can be digital or it can be physical stone models sent to us. If it's physical models, we do ask for cast quality, uh, something that you would send to your lab. We don't want bubbles and streaks and all that fun stuff because it makes it very hard for us to articulate once we get them here um, in our laboratory. Uh, once that's done, if we do get the physical model, they are they are digitized and placed into a software where we can virtually articulate. If you take a, a digital impression in your office or if you have a, a center who provides that service for you or maybe a referral, um, you would take your arches independently and then you would take a bite scan. That would be sufficient as well. Once we have the, the models articulated, then we would uh, create that virtual wax up using one of the softwares that we use. Um, those would be teeth that would, that would, or crowns that would virtually fit the space based on uh, average size. So we can only do what we can do virtually. We, we're not waxing these things up in our office. So what we would like um, a lot of the time, especially for a case like we presented today, is not to do a, a virtual wax up, but rather have your lab or your restorative doctor, if that's not you, create that wax up and either digitize it or take an impression like Dr. Wilson uh, talked about briefly in his presentation today and then send that as a separate model to us. Uh, the virtual wax ups are great, but it's harder to get that, that information exactly how your restorative um, component would like it without their input. Does that make sense? And once that virtual wax up is created, then it's imported just the same as a, a normal model. Um, like I showed you those different models that we had today, we would import that in before your meeting, hopefully, if we get that information before the meeting, we would import that in so that during our discussion, we can turn those models on and off to see what what the, mo what the virtual wax up looks like in place, and maybe we need to turn it off so that we can get some things, some, you know, lines out of our way so we can have a clear a more clear picture of what it is that we're trying to move and manipulate, but turn it on for instances where we want to check our angulation and our emergence. Awesome, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we have a pretty interesting question for Dr. Stewart. Um, doctor is asking, how do you feel about full arch or nearly full arch bridges that are cemented anteriorly but screw retained posteriorly? Um, I mean, Personal preference is the whole point of, of screwing it is so that it's, I mean, one is to reduce cement. So, I mean, yes, do you reduce cement by only cementing the anterior grounds um, to the bridge? Yes, but mainly it needs, it's, it's a benefit of it being retrievable. Um, so, I mean, if you glue half and screw half, then it's it's not retrievable. I and mean, maybe you can loosen the posteriors and tap it off if you needed, but it goes back to what Dr. Wilson was saying. You got to build back doors into into everything that you do because nothing is forever. Even with this patient being 75, you know, you still want to want to be able to. If she breaks, if she you know she breaks this or something, a crown or she you know if it was porcelain, if she chipped porcelain, you want to always be able to take these things off. Um, 
So if you, uh, I, I wouldn't um, feel comfortable doing that, knowing what I know. The, the other thing, if I may interject, I, I, I have to say I'm, I'm a very anti-cement person. In, in the fact that cement give any trouble for anywhere from 10 to 15 years and all of a sudden so if you can crew retain if the crew retain is not perfect you, you have to do a number of shenanigans you don't necessarily have to do with cemented but in the long run I think it's going to be a better restoration if it's uh, screw retained as opposed to cemented because of the biologic principle and and as you have alternatives to do I mean you could I mean, you know, if, if you knew you were going to do something, if you knew you were going to do a, a, a one-piece solution, you know, you could counter-seek the implants further and then use a multi-unit in the anterior, you know, kind of the, the altered screw access channels. I mean, luckily, um, manufacturers have found workarounds to where ideally you never have to glue anything into the mouth. Yeah, so you could use a screw bendable, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I have a uh, another interesting question. It's more of a, a preference um, for what you guys like, but from a standpoint of well, the doctor Doctor uh, Pecklin's asking um, how you feel about full arch or nearly nearly full arch bridges that are cemented anteriorly, but then screw retained posteriorly. Do you have an opinion on that? I, I think we just addressed that, Brett. I'm so sorry. I'm going to mute don't myself be sorry. again. Good. I'm going to meet myself again. We, I'm better we, that we way. The same answer, <laughs> if I get the same answer twice, let's say. <laughs> let's see. There are more questions. Let's see. Oh, we All have right. one. Dr. Wilson, do you do ID, uh, IV sedation for your surgeries? Yes. We, we, we do two things. So if, if, it's, if it's a single in the patient that's not terribly... Uh, ...specifically uh, uh, triazolam, halcyon, uh, if it's a larger case, uh, my partner, Dr. John Wilson, will do the IVs. If it's a real medical compromised case, uh, Sean Sepikar, the dentist anesthesiologist, does a lot of our sedation. So, yeah, I, I, I really like people to be nice and comfy, and uh, I like them to be disruptions. <laughs> Uh, Andy, why don't you go and show your screen? I think we'll we'll, we'll wrap up this. There was a um, a question about the cost. So, Andy, if you want to take there's a there's a there's a, a you guys have a really good. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Um, Andy, I'll let you talk. I have a tremendous echo. No, no problem. So um, it is uh, almost one o'clock central time here. So we're going to go ahead and start wrapping up this webinar. So I would just like to thank everyone once again uh, for participating today. We had a lot of great discussion. Um, it was a really great course. Um, we do apologize uh, about a little bit of the audio problems towards the end, but that's, that's kind of the nature of these, uh, these web-based platforms. Uh, so just as a brief reminder, um, right now on the schedule, we do have upcoming webinars. Uh, on the radiology side, so you can see that our um, our next one is actually tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central Time, and then we have two more radiology uh, webinars the following Thursday. And then we had a couple questions in regards to um, obtaining CE for this course. So that survey is going to populate once we actually um, conclude this webinar and close out of GoToMeeting. So go ahead and stay online for now, and once I close out the GoToWebinar, that survey will appear. Um, and part of the CE protocol is um, for you to go ahead and please fill out that survey. And once you submit it, we'll receive it on our end and be able to, um, to send you that attendance verification. 
Um, but thank you, everybody. We definitely appreciate um, you uh, showing up and participating. Dr. Wilson, Dr. Stewart, Brett, do y'all have any final remarks before we go ahead and conclude this course? Hey, I do. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, it. Lauren, you did a great job. Nathan, as usual, you did a fantastic job. Uh, and gosh, great questions. Uh, I, I hope we uh, answered them and, and, and I hope we help some people to do better implant dentistry because that's what we're all about. Everybody take care and be safe. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Uh, if those, we want to be very respectful of your time. It is one o'clock and that's what time the CE of this course ends at. I know there was some questions on actual pricing. So I think we have a, we have another slide that Andy can bring up, but uh, we'll go over that. But um, Dr. Stewart, I kind of cut you off. Did you have anything to say also? I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, you know, thank y'all for including me in this. Uh, it really, really was a, a really good experience. So okay, good to, to work with giants like Dr. Wilson and continue to, you know, become experts at our craft. Awesome. Thank you. I, I agree. It was a lot of fun putting this together and hosting it. And it looks like our response has been very positive. So thank you for all your efforts, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Wilson, for, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge. Um, Andy, go ahead and make this screen big. And, and I'll just kind of walk people through the pricing of this, of the anchor pin workflow. So you have an idea what the costs are. So with the... Uh, this this chart is kind of comparing the anchor pin guide workflow versus the connect workflow or the stackable. And um, I'm, you know, I think next week, I can't remember if it's next week or the week after, we're going to have Dr. Ben Jacobs out of New Jersey uh, provide a presentation on a very successful bone reduction mandible that he provided on the connect and the stackable concept. Uh, but for this presentation, you have an idea uh, because Dr. Stewart provided the snap on smile that kind of gave us the restorative. We could have provided the virtual wax up and that would have been an additional feed for what you're seeing right now. Um, but the VIP service of planning the case, bringing in the DICOM, bringing in the STL files, merging them together and creating an online meeting with you, maybe maybe the, your restorative doctor, your surgeons, and even your lab or the patient could have been on that meeting to kind of show its option, what the options are. That fee is, uh, is $150 whether it's one implant or six implants or upper and lower, it's always a set fee for a VIP for $150. Um, it's, in some situations, we don't need an anchor pin guide. In this case, we thought we felt like it was going to lead the most predictable and consistent result. So we added the anchor pin guide so you can kind of, it's great out there so as an option. So the anchor pin guide, the fee for that is $100. Um, the surgical guide, the anchor pin surgical guide was $225. And once again, the surgical guide is always 225, whether it's one implant or six implants, uh, bone born or whatever, it's always 225. So you can see that the VIP plus the surgical guide anchor pin was 375. We'd add the 100, so that'd make it 475. Uh, in this case, there was a passive fit, uh, what we call it anchor pin passive fit bridge that was milled out of a PMMA. Um, now we're actually printing them as well. But in this case, it was actually milled. And that we, we for that we charge eight hundred dollars for that for the design as well as the um, the cost of the bridge. So I think that kind of handles most of the questions as far as the uh, material as well as the pricing. But in conclusion, thank you very much for all your participation. Um, it was a lot of fun responding to you and kind of having some good sidebar conversations as well. And I hope you guys all have a blessed day. And thank you so much once again. And you'll be receiving that survey soon. Thank you, guys.